Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Bipolar Awakenings podcast with me, Sean Blackwell. And today I'm going to be talking to Kiana Fitzgerald. Kiana is a freelance journalist with bipolar disorder who got in touch with me after my last podcast with Chris Cole. Similar to Chris, even though Kiana is still struggling with her disorder, she also sees the spiritual dimension and value of her non-ordinary experiences, so much so that she started a thriving TikTok channel in order to share her unique perspective. And seeing what she was doing, I just had to meet her. Kiana, thank you for joining me here. Lovely to meet you. Lovely to meet you too, and thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so I was really curious about your story here and and what led to the whole TikTok thing. So first, you know, um, obviously everything started with a bipolar experience. What happened to you that set you on this journey? Sure. So um, the lead up to my first episode was uh, just a lot of stress for me. You know, it was, I was dating someone new who was kind of drifting away. Um, I had just quit um, a job that was pretty stable and I was looking for something more adventurous, more uh, something that where I had more freedom. And I also had to move out of the apartment that I was in all at the same time. So I was under a great deal of stress, which I've figured out is a trigger for many people, but definitely for me for uh, manic episodes. So I just kind of started praying, you know, I was like, I have to, I have to get out of this some way. How am I going to get out of this? And I just thrust myself into prayer And I remember there were many days where I was just crying and praying interchangeably. And from that moment forward, um, I started to experience these little coincidences and, um, you know, situations where things that in a real, in a regular world shouldn't happen were happening to me. You know, I was having great fortune. Um, You know, I had people coming into my life that were helping me and blessing me in unexpected ways. And then things just kind of ramped up from there. And I ended up, um, you know, experiencing some euphoria, but there was also some confusion. And um, I ended up having to move in the midst of this state. And that's when things got really confusing for me. And I ended up going missing for about a day and a half and they found me in a hospital. So that's the long, that's the short version of my story. Mm. For going for a bit of a longer version, mm-hmm. uh, and we we talked previously that we weren't going to get into synchronicities a lot, but yeah, what was one of the synchronicities that you felt like was really strong in your experience? Yeah, so um, I was very heavy into the Bible at that time, and mm-hmm. that was not something that I had been raised to do. You know, I, I was raised Christian, but we weren't like a Bible thumping family, so. Um, out of nowhere, I just kind of started gravitating toward the Bible. And I was, you know, really into certain characters like Noah, you know, and um, Mm -hmm. I was walking down the street trying to get to my new apartment. And this man just stopped me. And he was like, Hey, you know, I, I don't know what, what this is, but I feel compelled to speak to you. So I was like, Oh, sure, let's talk. And his name was Noah. And he said, Noah, like in the Bible. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> this is where we're going. So that's one of the examples that I, um, that I had experienced. All right. Yeah. And I, I think I might've mentioned before too, that even when I was building my internet channel, uh, I told my wife's family, I said, I know it's hard to understand, but it's like, I'm Noah and I'm building an ark for people <laughs> with bipolar disorder. So I have got some Noah connections. But so I was not in a manic episode though. Mm -hmm. I need to make that clear. It was just a metaphor. Yeah. (laughs) And what kind of non-ordinary experiences were you having that, and you ended up that way? It was just extreme empathy, I feel. Um, And I've always been an empathetic person, but around that time, it was like, I could feel what people were feeling. And I could feel when someone needed me to reach out to them, or if I was going through something and I thought about a person, they would immediately reach out to me without me contacting them whatsoever. So it was like that kind of thing where I would just, you know, have a sensation, you know, it's, it's hard to explain, but I think you understand um, where I just felt like I was moving through the world in the way that I was supposed to. And the universe was just connecting the dots and making sure that I was making the, the right connections with the right people, as well as, um, you know, affecting 
situations that I felt I needed to be inserted into. So yeah, it's, um, I'm trying to think of a specific uh, occurrence. Um, I would say, you know, I had come home shortly before the, this episode started. Um, and I was already starting to feel like the spiritual components of it. And I was sitting in church, uh, you know, I came home for a funeral and I was sitting in church with my grandmother whose brother had passed away. And I remember just like holding her and consoling her. And I just got this message out of nowhere that was like, your mission is to spread the word of God through music. And I was like, whoa, where did that come from? Like, what is that? And then I remember like doubting it and doubting it. And then I saw another message, which was, don't let anyone look down on you because you're younger and inexperienced. Like, just go for it. Something to that effect. I know it's like a Bible verse or something like that. But um, yeah, it was just like, I would get these very profound messages from nowhere. And I was just kind of like, how do I take this? Who do I tell about this? And, you know, how do I move forward? Right. And did you see yourself, sounds like certainly in that state, you felt like you were a bit of an empath. No? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Did you see yourself as an empath prior to? So life before bipolar is so interesting because I feel like I knew who I was and I knew that I was living a life, but it didn't feel mm -hmm. like I was actually living. It kind of felt like I was going through the motions, even though I'd had success and I'd been, you know, in great places and done great things. I still was just kind of like, okay, like, what am I really here for? You know? So before I had my first episode, I was empathetic, but I was also slightly detached. If that makes sense. You know, I was sure. like, yeah, I was just kind of like, okay, I'm here, you know, and I want to do a good job at the job that's in front of me. And I want to be a good person to the people who are around me, but there was still that film in between me and reality. And I don't think that really dissipated until I had my first manic experience. Okay. Do you feel like, um, that that film is back up now that your episode is over or do you feel like something permanently kind of shifted? I feel like something permanently shifted for sure. Um, you know, ever since I had that first experience in 2016, um, I've had three other major episodes since then and a couple of small ones and things are just different now, you know, whether I'm in the midst of mania or not, I just know that there's something on the other side of that film. And I know that, I know that in time, maybe I will be able to integrate those experiences a bit more. But um, as of today, I feel like I'm still kind of struggling with how do I rectify my emotions and how do I translate that and communicate with people who've never experienced this before? Because that's my main thing as a journalist. I want people to better understand X, Y, or Z. And this is a huge thing that I want people to better understand. So in order for me to tap into that, I feel like I have to continually work through those things and hopefully get to a point where it's not dominating my life because I'm not going to lie. It's something that I think about every day, those experiences. And sometimes I wish I could feel those feelings again, even though they were very unstable. Um, but that's the allure of mania. You know, that's something that many people get trapped in. And so I'm just trying to get to a point where I'm not constantly driven by, you know, those experiences and what I would like to get out of those experiences. It sounds like aside from the euphoria of the manias that feel fantastic and all that mm -hmm. stuff, it seems like you're still grateful for the experience, even though it's set you back somewhat. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I am 1000% grateful to have experienced what I've experienced. I feel like it changed my life for the better. Um, I know that there are some caveats here and there, but overall it has absolutely tra transformed how I see myself within the world and how I see other people in the spaces around me as well. So, you know, it just gives me like greater perspective, greater insight, um, especially with people who are dealing with mental disorders. I just feel much more um, in informed, you know, in terms of 
how to have a conversation with somebody who's going through a depressive episode or someone who's going through a manic episode or someone who's seeing or hearing things like my family. Um, you know, my brother, he's, um, older than me and he's schizoaffective. My mother passed away, but I'm pretty sure she had some kind of mental condition. And my grandmother was just diagnosed as schizophrenic. So it's very much in my family. Um, I don't know much beyond my grandmother because, you know, we didn't really talk about that. But yeah, I feel like being born into this essentially has helped me to help my family. So that's another reason why I'm like, you know, this is something that I'm okay with because it's giving me some perspective. Mm -hmm. And and that's interesting compared to some of the other people I've talked to specifically. um, I would come across like um, two uh, brother and sister or a couple of brothers and one has a milder disorder and the other has a more severe disorder. And Mm -hmm. the one with the milder disorder um, feels like they're compelled to understand their condition so that they can help their brother or sister. Yeah. Now, sounds like you're kind of in a similar place with your family. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I would say that my condition is more or, okay. I would say my condition is less disruptive than my brother's and my grandmother's conditions. Um, you know, I am able to relatively quickly come in and out of those episodes and get back into the real world, so to speak. So mm-hmm. I feel like I have a not a better grip, but just a more a more tangible um, you know, grasp on what's happening with me as opposed to, you know, my family members who, you know, one of them is in denial, you know, and the other one is um, you know, aware and if anything, that person helped me to better understand myself in turn. And when you say denial, do you mean like they're saying there's nothing wrong with me? Everybody else has a problem with me, but I'm fine. Like that kind of denial. Yeah. The, the denial specifically is there's nothing wrong with me. It's generic medication that is making me hallucinate. So it's been like years and years of the same uh, story being reiterated of it's not me. It's not me, but this person you know, is at the the forefront of our lineage. So it's like, you know, how can we really um, ignore the fact that we have other family members who are going through similar things? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I know there's, there's pressure or there's a perspective from psychiatry that says, well, it's genetic because it came mm-hmm. from your grandmother and that. My own perspective is, okay, before we get to the genetics, first, you can't see that scientifically. There's no, there's no proof of that. Mm-hmm. But There's a lot of intergenerational trauma that can pass from one person to the next, you know, and, and I, and I see, for example, your disorder is probably related to the rest of your family, Mm -hmm. but because of the sort of trauma that is related to um, having a grandmother with a serious disorder. Was it your grandmother you were talking about? Yes. Yes. Yeah. um, That's intergenerational trauma is something I actually have a a tab open now about that um, just because I'm so curious to learn more about it. Um, That's something that I strongly feel is more impactful in my perspective anyway, than a simple like genetic explanation. You know, I feel like it's, you know, my grandmother went through horrible things. Her grandmother went through horrible things and it's just, um, I just find it really impossible for those experiences not to have somehow passed on into me. It's a tough subject because I remember when I had my first episode, um, you know, they told me I was a paranoid schizophrenic initially, and then they came back and said that I was bipolar. And, you know, I remember getting this, this stack of information about the conditions, like this is what could be your situation. This is another situation that could be your situation. And, I remember reading the one for paranoid schizophrenia and it was like, okay, there are, you know, environmental factors, genetic factors, and then there's something else that we just don't know. And I was like, oh, I know for me, it's like, it's probably slavery, you know? And I was like, of course I was still manic, but in, even in my stable mindset, I was like, maybe that does make sense. And this was before I found out about intergenerational trauma. 
So I very much got to a point after that experience where I was like, maybe there is something here about like slavery. And then, you know, the, the things that came after those specific instances and were carried through and carried through. Cause even my great grandfather, um, he was born in the 1920s. Um, you know, I'm pretty sure he had some, something going on there too. So, um, you know, it just makes me think a lot and it makes me want to investigate, especially as a journalist, you know, I'm very interested in investigating my own family. So yeah, there's definitely something going on here. And of course me being who I am, I'm like, I have to get to the bottom of this and I'm, I may never, and I have to, I have to understand that, but I'm going to try and see what happens. Yeah. And I, I, Personally, I haven't had a lot of experience working with clients with that sort of intergenerational trauma that goes back to slavery. But in Germany, it's it felt like I was talking about World War II with every client I had, mm. you know. Mm-hmm. And, and it was very clear that most Germans with bipolar have intergenerational trauma as part of their, their issue, you know. Wow. We wanted to get into your work as a journalist a little bit. <clears throat> and uh, it seems like in this podcast, all roads somehow lead to Kanye West. And <laughs> you've got quite a Kanye West story to tell. Chris Cole brought him up. And uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of space to talk about your experience in, in writing an article uh, about him. Yeah. So I've written a few articles about Kanye at this point, but the one that I feel was um, a major breaking open for me was... Um, a 2019 article that I wrote for Vibe, Vibe magazine. And it was basically connecting the dots between Kanye's newfound, um, we can say obsession with, um, or maybe not obsession, that's a strong word, his newfound um, faith with, um, you know, with Jesus and with God and the church and everything like that. And this is, this was a marked turn for him. He wasn't someone like that was very invested in these topics, like he had songs like I am a God and, you know, he had called himself Jesus. So it was pretty much a 180 from those days, especially the other kinds of content that were in those songs, very hedonistic, sex driven, drug driven, things like that. And, you know, he kind of stopped on a dime and transformed and began talking about God and Jesus specifically. And I was like, that sounds really familiar, you know? Um, And it was just like, I had to put pen to paper and get people to understand that this was not something that's an isolated situation. So um, yeah, I started writing the article and funny enough, I was ramping up into a manic state myself when I wrote it, to to be quite honest. And um, I was hypomanic. I'll say that, you know, I wasn't like full-blown manic, but I was able to concentrate And I feel being in that state helped me to draw specific descriptions into the piece and help people to understand, like, if you're in the midst of this, this is what's, this is likely what's happening to some people. It's not a universal experience. And I've tried to make that clear in my writing, in my TikTok and everything that I do, that this is not something that everyone goes through. This is just my own unique perspective, but it aligns very closely with what Kanye is going through, which is his feelings that, you know, he could be a chosen one, his feelings that he could be someone that God has specifically chosen to carry out a mission to bring people closer to him. And that's something that I have felt in my manic experiences was, um, you know, like, feeling divine and feeling this, this channel of energy directly into me. And it feels like it's only into me. And, you know, just the sensation of it's my job. I got to save people and I have to save people through love. And that's the, the crux of what I feel he's going through too. And of course, you know, he's kind of going through a divorce right now and he's saying and doing things that are out of the ordinary and people are talking a lot about that. But, um, at the end of the day, I just want people to understand, like, this is what this man could be going through. This is what I've been through. You are free to draw parallels, but I just want information out there. Mm-hmm. And the album, uh, I think you're referring to mostly titled it Jesus is King. Yes. I mean, <laughs> yeah. It doesn't one, get more right? straightforward than that. 
Yeah. And there was a few quotes from that article that I, I found interesting that I kind of wanted to read here. In my personal experience, heightened mania feels like you're the oracle sent to speak to the rest of the world on behalf of the Most High, like you're the one selected to advance humanity through never-before-seen methods. Sound familiar? <laughs> and, you know, the only difference between me and my sense of mission and a person who's manic feeling a sense of mission is I've been doing this for 15 years, <laughs> day after day after day. But mm -hmm. other than that, I mean... If I thought I could accomplish it all in one day, maybe it would be manic, but I certainly feel a sense of mission. I mean, and, and it's very rewarding. It's yeah. a lot better than working in advertising. <laughs> yeah, thank God for that. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I would say, um, you know, I would hope that everybody feels driven to complete a mission as anyone would be in a manic state. Of course, do it more responsibly, more... Um, you know, in a way that's actually digestible. But mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know. I just feel like Kanye is someone who is absolutely, you know, for the longest time, you know, if you if you have watched the Genius documentary, um, he's from day one been like, I'm that guy. I'm going to change, you know, hip hop as we know it. I'm going to change the way that we look at MCs. I'm going to change fashion. I'm going to change, et cetera, et cetera. Like he's been driven to change things on a very, very granular and grand scale. And, you know, not everybody functions like that. So I feel mm -hmm. like some of that is driven by a manic mind state. Um, and I know for myself, you know, I have dreams of changing the world too. And I'm not manic right now, but I still feel like I could accomplish it. Just like you said that, you know, you have similar, you know, understandings. So yeah. Um, that quote specifically, I feel, um, was more about just getting people to understand like the the intensity of those moments. Mm -hmm. So when you wrote, I have a confession, I still believe Kanye West can change the way we talk about mental health. Yes. <clears throat> in what way? You know, or first, you agree, you still agree with what you wrote there. And <laughs> yeah. in... in and how do you think he can change the way we talk about mental health? Yeah. So I still believe that. And I feel like if, and this is a big if, if he is to come out and say, hey, these are my experiences when I'm in mania. And these are my experiences when I'm not in mania. And let's compare the two. If he were to come out himself and actually speak about the moments when he is going through these episodes, I feel like people could better understand, oh, like he's not just an asshole, you know, like he's not just a person who is um, self-absorbed and only cares about himself. And, you know, the list goes on, the things that people feel about him. Um, I feel like if he were to just be open beyond like making an album about Jesus or putting I hate being bipolar, it's awesome on an album cover, which he did in 2018. Um you know, I feel like just getting more depth from him would be helpful. But if he doesn't, if he doesn't feel comfortable coming out and discussing his personal experiences with this disorder, then I feel like we'll just, you know, carry on the way that we are until someone else comes along and they open up and they write a book or they do whatever they do. But yeah, I feel like Kanye has great potential. It's just a matter of how does he want to use that potential and is he comfortable doing it? And it seems like based on his accolades and his willingness to put himself out there in other ways that he could be in a position to do this, but only time will tell. Mm -hmm. And even in the documentary, it was uh, the documentary filmmaker Cootie. Cootie, yeah. Cootie. He made reference to the fact that he felt like Kanye never processed the death of his mother, who mm. who he was very close to and had passed away at 58, and that after that, he was different. Yeah. He noticed that, and it certainly seemed like Cootie could recognize that this, this trauma had impacted and led to some of the disorder. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And I feel, you know, I lost my mother when I was 19, I'm 32 now, I had my first experience at 27. And, you know, I feel like 
I remember sitting in therapy, you know, shortly before my first episode and I was just sobbing and I was like, I thought I was over her death. I'm not over her death. Like, what do I do? How do I move past this? And the therapist was like, it's okay. You can still grieve. You know, you, you don't have to shut it off. But it was at that moment that I realized that I had just been running through life, you know, just like speeding through life, going from, you know, undergrad to grad school in a two week span and, you know, um, going from grad school to DC and DC to New York. And, you know, I was just flying through life. And then it wasn't until I actually sat down in therapy for a few months and finally got to a point where I was open enough to have those conversations that I realized, wow, like I have not processed this. So, um, yeah. And then shortly after I had my first episode and I felt like my mother was there with me and I felt like I could feel her spirit. And, you know, it was that's pretty much how I feel every time I have an episode is I feel very close to her. So, um, Mm -hmm. yeah, I can understand uh, Kanye's positioning as well. Mm -hmm. And you grew up without a father. So losing your mother at 19, you said? Yeah, 19. It's even like there are no parents there for you at a very young age. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was it was a challenging time for sure. I bet it's it's incredible that you were able to continue and get the education you did and get it. You mentioned a ma- master's degree in mass communi- media. Okay. You can do it for me. It's a complicated <laughs> New media name. and mass communication, new media and mass communication. Yes. And, okay. There you go. I mean, how many people who, who lose their parents before the age of 19 go on to get a master's degree? You know, yeah, it's really, really something, you know, Thank you. So you wanted to talk about music a little bit as well. And obviously Kanye has played a huge role in your life. Uh, How else has music come into your disorder, come into your vision? Yeah. So music is, speaking of my mother, um, you know, music is something that has been in my life since I was a baby. Um, Was listening to a lot of hip hop, obviously, but um, also like R&B and the blues and, you know, um, little, little pop here, little rock and roll there, but not too much, but yeah, hip hop has been a part of my life for since the beginning. So when I have these manic experiences, it's, it's all consuming, you know, like for example, um, once I get into the midst of mania, I'll listen to an album and I'll be like, Oh my God, like God is speaking to me through this album. I've never heard it this way before. Like I have to tell everybody to listen to this album. So I'll call my brother and I'll tell him, Hey, you got to listen to this. You have to listen to this. And then I will like wait by the phone for him to call me back and like, tell me that he heard the same thing that I heard. And obviously he doesn't, but he'll kind of like, you know, talk to me in a way because he understands that someone who's schizoaffective himself, he understands that like sometimes the messages just feel like they're there. So um, yeah, that's the, the, that's the main part of my experience with music and mania. And also I'll feel like um, hip hop specifically is like a new Bible, you know, like listening to these albums and listening to these artists, it feels like I'm hearing the story of creation all over again, but in a new and compelling way. Not to say the Bible isn't compelling, but, you know, it's not as compelling as, you know, like a one of my favorite rap albums. So, yeah, um, I feel just very immersed in it. And it's all I do when I become manic is just listen to music and talk to people, of course, because I feel like I have to get a message out there. But mainly it's just sitting down, listening to music alone and just writing in my journal for like hours on end. You know, and, and when I was in my, uh, when I was in my manic episode, my spiritual emergency, I, mm-hmm. I never even thought of it as a manic episode when it happened. Yeah. But I had seen Della Soul in mm-hmm. concert in Vancouver. And then that was like two months earlier. And then I was listening to their cassette and they were talking about an, a new coming Daisy age. And I was just all like, oh, this is what's happening. This is what's going on. We're in the Daisy Age. This is yeah. what Della Soul is talking about. So, yeah. But <laughs> any, the weird part is that anybody who was listening to their lyrics could see what I was talking about. It wasn't like I was sort of making these big leaps, of, mm-hmm. like manic leaps. No, no, it was right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it all comes up for you. And, you know, we're talking about hip hop. Um you mentioned in wanting even to do this interview that you felt like there needed to be more 
diversity in the conversations mm -hmm. around mental health. And I, I was thinking about that and I was like, you know, like if you will, if you watch my videos, mm -hmm. I'm not in them very much, right? <laughs> I mean, it's just slideshows. Yeah. And most of my Facebook friends come um, to me on Facebook because they've seen my videos. Mm -hmm. All my Facebook friends are white. <laughs> I have no control over that. Yeah. They just send me friends. But there are so few people of color that reach out to me, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know. What's your perspective on the whole thing? And and how can we move this along? Yeah. What do you think? Well, my perspective <laughs> is, um, you know, I have a lot of hopes and wishes. You know, I would love for the communities that I am, you know, struggling to get into. Um, it would be wonderful if I could like see myself within them, but in, in my lifetime, you know, the spaces that I have been in, you know, whether it is grad school or, you know, um, an office, a journalism job or anything like that, I tend to be the minority. So it's not shocking to me, but it is like, we can do better. You know, we can, um, do things that invite people that are not of the same background, the same, um, whatever you want to call it, we can do better in terms of inviting those folks into this space. And I, you know, I'm just knocking on doors, you know, I, that's what I did when I reached out to you. I was just like, I've been watching his videos for years. You know, I feel like, you know, they had this conversation. He and Chris Cole had this conversation. I know Chris Cole a little bit. So I was like, this is like my best chance to try to enter this specific, um, you know, environment. So I think that's part of it is some people having the courage to knock on that door. But also, I think that it's important to like have the other side, you know, of the situation where people are opening the door freely and making sure that, you know, like if someone, for example, um, had a, a spiritual emergency and they just need help understanding it and they can't afford a session with like, you know, whomever just being like, you know, I understand that this community is not as represented. So I'm going to, you know, do this pro bono, pro bono, you know, it's like there could be anything like that where we're just making sure that people aren't getting left behind. Growing up in the 80s, going to a school that had 100 nationalities, mm -hmm. the fact that we're sitting here dealing with racism in 2022, is mm -hmm. it's really disappointing. I mean, it's just like, you got to be kidding. Yeah. You know? um, and in some ways, um, things seem to be getting worse. You know? Yeah, in um, some ways, yeah. Or it feels like we just have more access. I feel that's my opinion. Anyway, I feel like things could be better, could be worse, but the, the ugliest of it all is all coming to the forefront because we have cell phones where we can capture things happening. And we have social media where people can spout off their opinions without much consequence. So I feel like that's making it feel like it's right in our face, but yeah, you know, it's, I guess it, it also depends on where you are. Like, you know, I know if I was like in, in Toronto or something, it would be not as, you know, <laughs> heavy as it is yeah. here in the States. But uh, yeah, it's, yeah. um, it's, it's, it's boring. You know, I'm over racism. I wish it was just like <laughs> over. It's boring. But... <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. boring. Okay. Let's get into it. I had you here because I was blown away by your TikTok channel. How did that come about? Yeah, good old TikTok. <laughs> so um, I have a friend, a dear friend named Laura, and she and I have talked about our experiences within mania um, and or even just like a heightened state. You know, it doesn't even have to be mania exactly. And, you know, we talk about it often. And she was like, you know what? you should start talking about this more openly, like start this website, start this, start that. And I was like, oh, sure, I'll think about it. And she kind of just kept like nudging me, like you should start a TikTok specifically. Like, I feel like you do really well in that area. And, you know, I've been on TikTok. I know that it's all superficiality and, you know, <laughs> idiocy sometimes, but I didn't expect that space to be for me. But I was like, you know what, I'll give it a try. So um, I just uploaded my first video um, in April 
one. Yeah, it's been about a year. Um, so I uploaded my first video and I was I was not expecting anything. I was just like, hey, you know, literally sat outside of my balcony and was like, hey, I want to talk about something new. I want to talk about my bipolar disorder. And then I just kind of quickly, briefly explained what it was and told people like, I'm going to talk about the lead up to my first episode and the factors that contributed to it in my next video. Didn't expect much. And I got about a thousand views on that video in a day. And I was like, whoa, like this is not what I was expecting. Was yeah. that your first video? Yeah, my first on video. Subject? A thousand yeah. views in the first day. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So um I was shocked. You know, I didn't think anybody cared that much. And then I made the next video and that one got about the same amount of views. And then my third video was, you know, I made it in the dead of night. <laughs> I had just gotten home from somewhere and I was like, you know, I'm I'm just gonna make a video. I had no script. I was just like, bam, let's talk about bipolar type one manic episodes. And I uploaded that video and went to sleep and woke up and I had about 80 something thousand views. And then as of now, it's up to about 800,000 views. So it's, it's a very, uh, you know, I would say it's a polarizing topic because some people feel like, or some people felt as though I was diagnosing people just because they've had heightened experiences. And then other people felt like, whoa, I've never heard anybody articulate it in this way. Thank you. So, you know, there were opposite opinions and I'm I'm fine with that, but I'm learning a lot as I go. I don't think it was luck that you ended up with 20,000 subscribers within a year on TikTok. Obviously your education, your, your skills as a journalist have impacted what you're doing. And you know, we didn't mention, but you've worked for National Public Radio as well, you know, coming out of your master's degree. Mm -hmm. How did your communication education and experience influence your TikTok approach? Great question. I think my experience in the communication and journalism world had everything to do with how I have set up this TikTok account and how I have grown the account. And I'm not somebody who's like, you know, every single video, like, make sure you follow me, make sure you follow me. Like, I, I don't do that. I'm just kind of like, here's the information, take it or leave it. So um, I feel like my approach is very straightforward, very earnest. And I don't think there's a lot of that on TikTok. You know, there's a lot of, you know, it's like, oh, look at me be sexy or look at me be hot, yeah. you know, and it's like, okay, I just want to talk like, you know, so um, I think that's part of it. And also, I strongly feel like, um just the the fact that I care a lot about words, you know, I love writing. Mm -hmm. I love being a journalist. I am enamored with what I do and I'm so grateful that I can do it. I want to bring that love and that energy into each video that I do. And I want it to seem like, you know, not only am I speaking to you, but I'm also trying to like uplift you and educate you at the same time, which is what I aim to do in my writing in general. So definitely, um, I feel like my background has informed what I do and I'm grateful that I'm able to like translate certain feelings and emotions and experiences into like palatable, digestible content as the kids say. Yeah. And I think that's what I saw. You know, I started clicking through your TikToks and I was like, this is really refreshing and different and objective and clean. And I never imagined being able to do anything constructive on TikTok. And, yeah. You know. I, if I hadn't tried it, I would have never thought it was possible. <laughs> it, it was just something that I was like, this is a waste of time, but thankfully <laughs> it's not a waste of time. You know, I feel like um, I've, I don't feel, I know that people have said that I've helped them. Like my sister she goes through my comments. I don't read them myself because I'm very, you know, anxious about that kind of sure. thing. So um, she was reading them to me the other night and she said, this person told you that you helped them to get diagnosed. Like they didn't know that they had bipolar until they watched your videos and saw that they had similar symptoms. And then they went to the doctor and they found out that they have bipolar. So um, there are comments like that. Um, there are comments where people just say, you know, thank you for helping me to understand my family member or my partner. Or, you know, thank you for helping me to not feel alone. Like that's the the gist of it for me is I just don't want people to feel alone. 
and I want people to feel like they have a voice. And that's why I do what I do in general. You know, I'm a journalist because I want to give voice to the voiceless. And I feel like that very much translates over to what I do on TikTok. Mm -hmm. And no milk crates. I didn't see a single milk crate in any of your videos. <laughs> Not a one. <laughs> Good. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, amazing. And then, you know, just to finish off, I guess, um, there was something about you that just, it humbled me, you know, <laughs> because you have an article posted, Megan Thee Stallion, who maybe... You know, the baddest bitch on the planet right now. If there was an award, that would probably be the award that she would get. And you had that article on the cover of Paper Magazine, which I think might be the coolest magazine in America. I mean, so your cool quotient is just over the top. First, congratulations. And I'm going to put the image of the magazine cover right here. Okay. In our little interview. What gave you the courage to interview this woman? <laughs> Wow. <laughs> so I got kind of lucky. Um, yeah. I had a couple of friends years, a couple of years prior who um, I went to dinner with them and they were like, Hey, have you heard of this girl, Megan? She's from Texas. I'm from Texas. So they're mm -hmm. like, you should listen to her. So I was like, sure. So I listened to her early work and I was like, I have to talk to this girl. Like I have to, I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to make it happen some way or another. So, so you were on to her before she was anything. It sounds yeah, like. Yeah, yeah. She's just a local Houston rapper. Yes, exactly. Okay. So, um, you know, I was working for this hip hop publication in um, 2018, which was the year before this this feature. And I remember inviting her, like I reached out to her team and I was like, hey, I want to bring, like, is she traveling anytime soon? I want to bring her into the office. It was in New York. And they were like, yeah, we'll actually be there for like a press run. So I was like, bet. So I am working at this publication and I tell them, we have this girl coming in here. She's incredible. She's beautiful. She's almost six feet tall. Like, you know, she's like a knockout. So I'm like, we have to do something on video with her or take pictures of her, do something. And it just went in one ear and out the other. And they did not listen. So I was oh. like, okay. So I brought her in. She played me some music. I interviewed her the first time. So I've spoken with her before this cover. So, um, I brought her in. So you met her. personally. It wasn't yeah. just an over the phone interview. Okay. Yeah. I met her the first time in and, Houston? um, in New York, in New York. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, she had come through on a press run. So, um, she plays the music and I interview her and, you know, we take a couple pictures and then she dashes off to her next appointment. And so, a few months go by and then I am in touch with her mother. Actually, um, her mother was her publicist. She passed away a couple of years ago, but um, I was in touch with her mother, Holly. And she said, Hey, we want you to premiere her first big music video. And I was like, Oh my God, I would love to do that. Big old freak. I don't know if you're familiar with that song, but um, <laughs> yeah. So I premiered that video and then the, the charts. What, that... what does it mean to premiere it? Like, Oh, sure. It? What is that? Yeah. Mean? So to premiere a video is um, when an artist comes to you and they're like, I want to collaborate with you as a publication in order to get more views or more eyes on my, my work, essentially. Okay. So there's no payment exchange. It's just like, I think that you could benefit me and I think that this could benefit you as well. That's essentially okay. what a premiere comes down to. And what was your platform at the time? Um, so it was Complex Magazine. Okay, so you were working on Complex and she wanted to premiere on Complex. Yes. Okay, got yes. it. Yes. So, and also there was just like an established level of trust between her, her mother and I. So it was mm. like, she, we feel like she's the best person to do this. So let's give it to her kind of thing. So, wow, so she really knows you, like, you know, her, you like, you know, yeah. each other. Yeah. I feel wow, like okay. if I were to meet her again, she would be like, oh yeah, I remember you. You know, I don't know right. if it would be like. You know, like, oh my God, let's like chill together. But you know, I think it's not she would at least Kanye. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, but um, okay. yeah. So I ended up premiering the video, and um, it went off the charts. And that's when the people at Complex were like, "Oh, maybe we should have done something with her, and maybe we should have <laughs> done a video or a picture or something." And I was like, "Yeah, no shit." 
<laughs> so You're rolling um, your eyes. Like, yeah, oh exactly. God. Yeah. So I ended mm-hmm. up leaving Complex um, a few months after that. And that's around the time that um, Paper Magazine reached out to me. And they were like, hey, you know, we want to do this cover story on Megan. Would you be interested? And I like dropped everything. I was like, yes, <laughs> I am down. <laughs> so um, that's How when- How did they uh, find out about you? How did Paper find out about you? Yeah, I think if I'm not mistaken, um, you know, I had been doing some freelance work after I left Complex. So my name was getting out there a little bit more in that respect. And then also, I think that they just recognized that, you know, I had one of her early interviews and I had premiered mm. that video with her. So they knew that we had an established relationship. So they were like, OK, we feel like she'd be a good pick. OK, so just to clarify this. Mm hmm. So paper reached out to you. <laughs> you didn't like send them an article and please post my article. I've got this. No, paper reached out to you. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's what I, I think. I'm talking to the next Oprah Winfrey here. I think that's what's going on. Really. <laughs> we shall see. <laughs> Only time will tell. <laughs> yeah. Um, quite a story. That's very impressive. Thank you. Um, Please tell me that Megan is not nearly as scary in real life as she is in videos. <laughs> she terrifies me in videos. I watch her videos. I feel like I've just had my balls chopped off. <laughs> that is so funny. Oh, my God. Um, she is lovely. <laughs> She's yeah. so sweet. And, um, yeah, when I the last time I spoke to her for the paper article, um, you know, I was just like, there are some things that didn't make it into that interview just because they were kind of like questions that I just had for myself and mm-hmm. um, or comments that I had for myself. And one of them was, oh, I think this actually made it in there. Um, you know, I had driven a boat just shortly before I interviewed her and early on in her career before COVID and everything, she would do this thing called driving the boat where she would like pour alcohol into the mouths of like other people. And it was just like, oh, happy, go lucky, whatever. And so she eventually was like, yeah, I want to drive a boat one day. And then I told her that I drove a boat, literally. And she was like, what? (laughs) You drove a boat before me? I want to drive a boat. And I was like, yeah, you should. It's so exhilarating. And then like a couple months later, she was out there driving a boat. So (laughs) very precious. Uh, Kiana, thanks so much for joining us here today. And I have absolutely no doubt that you're going to make an impact, you know, whether it's it's going to be the bipolar thing. I mean, you're going to make you're going to make an impact. You're going to be a kind of Kanye West, um, maybe a smaller version of Kanye West. <laughs> I'm fine with that. <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't know if I'm going to see on the Forbes list. He was number two, by the way, mm. um, for entertainers. Oprah was number one. He was number two in terms of most valuable uh, celebrity billionaires. Wow, you know, billionaire, yeah. rapper, rapper, billionaire. Kind of hard to get. <laughs> you know, my head around it yeah but um but yeah i mean it was just really great having you here and i hope we can do other things in the future you know collaborate maybe on different subjects related to bipolar and that sort of thing okay yeah thank you for having me i had an amazing time just sharing my story and you know being asked some good questions by you and uh you know being able to just think about the things that we go through you know as as a culture you know as humans So I really appreciate it um, talking to you. Great. And if anybody wants to reach out to Kiana, they can do so at her website. I've got it listed here, kianafitz.com. That's right. Perfect. Yeah. And if anybody wants to talk to me, I'm at bipolarawakenings.com. You can check out my website there. And uh, that's about it for today. Okay. Thanks. See you later.